God of presence of hope and of love. We've gathered this morning assured of all of this and, and even more that we get from you. And while we are in awe that our Creator names every single one of us as a beloved child, we fully embrace that calling by you. In doing so, we also welcome the calling from you, God, to be light in people and places of darkness, to be hope in people and places where hope seems unattainable, to be peace with our reconciliation between one another and, and even more difficult with those with whom we disagree. Our calling from you to be love, especially with those who are sort of unlovable. And to be justice for those without voice and those pressed to the margins and those who continue to be oppressed. Oh, divine presence, we know without your strength and your guidance and your courage, we can't do these things. We can't be light and hope and peace and love and justice. Not without you. So prepare us and help us to be your eyes and your hands and your feet and your heart. God, you've heard our prayers we've lifted this morning. We're, we want to pray for those who are serving in armed forces. For those in the, the line of fire that are innocent for lives lost and chains forever as a result of war. And so we pray, oh, how we pray for peace. Don't ever make it something to us that we think can never happen because it can never happen if we go with that attitude. So be with our veterans, active duty, their families. God, be with the memory this morning of, of those who we've lost those cultures we visit those sacred grounds and while we know those grounds only hold the shells of our loved ones they are still sacred in their way for others who recognize and remember family members in other ways we ask that you be with them and, and God over time give us joy in the memory and in the gratefulness that we were loved that much that we grieve this hard. God, we lift to you some joys this morning for Kenny and Mason's first year anniversary, for Pam's time away with Mike, for Lynn and Scott who celebrate 35 years, for Miss Elnora who continues to be grateful and such an inspiration to us coming Sunday after Sunday. God, we thank you for Bob and, and for his daughter who's now three years clean and how she's being a mom to those sons. So we pray you be with Bob on his trip to Kansas and give them a joyful time. We're thankful for Enid's mom who's six months cancer free. And we're thankful for all in this church, oh God, that do so many things behind the scenes because they care about this church. So continue to be with us at Bluegrass be with our members who are traveling today or perhaps absent because they're tending to self-care or care of others. Be with those who are yet to enter our doors and be with us all and guide us to all that you imagine we can do without our naysay opinion about it. 
Now, God, we ask that you be with these folks we've lifted. Be with Jerry as he seems to continue to have medical situation after one after another. Be with Pam's dad and her mom. Be with my niece Holly and her mom Twyla who provides such care for her. Be with Kay Langer as she cares for her sister and be with her sister. God, be with Nancy and, and her sisters and her mom as they make this effort towards reconciliation. We're thankful for that effort. But it is stress and anxiety, so we pray that you'll continue to be with them. God, we thank you for Stanley who reminds us week after week to be grateful for our life. And he prays for his co-workers at Kroger's and the anxiety that they're having with so many changes. His friends at Hope Positive and Aval. God, we pray for Michelle Bailey and for Quinn and for her partner, Kim. As Michelle begins this five-week or so journey with radiation, she'll feel alone at times. She'll feel helpless at times. But God, just remind her not to give up, that she's surrounded by people who love her, as is Teresa. We get this news, God, and it takes us off our feet. It's a curveball. It's something we don't expect. And those of us who like to control things, we, it just really sends us reeling. Help us understand, God, that we control what we can and we give to you what we can't. So God, remind Teresa and Michelle that this church family loves them. These pastors love them and we're going to be lifting in prayer and we're going to be taking meals and we're going to be running errands or whatever we need to do because that's what family does. So, oh God, as we continue in this worship, remind us of who we are and whose we are. And may we live into that. Amen. Wait for listening, hearing our prayers. You always love us. You're always there for your reminders and for your time. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. 
When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So it was on Easter Sunday when Pam and Kenny and I did a tag team preaching of sorts. First we shared a cross moment in our lives. At times it seemed particularly dark and hopeless. And then we followed that up with sharing a resurrection moment that came out of that. So it was in the aftermath of that service that I began to reflect on how we can find resurrection from very difficult times in our life. So I asked myself, what, what happens? What makes it possible for us to make that movement from cross to resurrection moment over and over again in our lives? And that's when I began to think about things or people who have a way of helping me or us get to that transition. Or I began to think about things or people who make it very difficult for me to find resurrection. And so this series was born thinking about who can block our faith if we allow it. So the first week I launched the series and shared my number one faith blocker group, evangelicals, who claim to take the Bible literally. I followed that up with the second week, and I discussed a second group of faith blockers to me, politicians. On the third sin Sunday, Kenny preached, and he gave us a, a personal account of his number one faith blocker. It was him, which made us all recognize that sometimes we ourselves block our faith journey. And then last week, I sort of reversed course and said, I told you a little bit of a fib the first week when I said number one undoubtedly was the evangelicals. And last week I said, actually, the real number one is family. Difficult family members. So as I've been praying and studying these past couple of weeks and preparing for this morning's worship, I felt led by God to share with you not another group that can block my faith if I allow it, but rather feelings that can block my faith. In the mid-1970s, Morris Albert wrote the lyrics and recorded a song that hit number six on the Billboard charts. Feelings, nothing more than feelings. I see some grins. Some of you know that, huh? How many of y'all heard that song? It's a very sad song. It's strange how song titles from when I was a teenager come into my mind when I'm thinking about sermons or sermon titles. You know, once we write a sermon as pastors, we got to think of some title. I think some weeks I should just say sermon. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me longer to figure out a title than to write the sermon. But that's the life of a, of a pastor, I guess. But anyway, this song title came to me as I thought about how our feelings at any given time can really play head games and heart games with our faith journey. So how those feelings can be faith blockers. 
This morning, Lynn read from John chapter 11, the story of Lazarus' illness, death, and resurrection in one form or another. And so I selected a few verses, but I think, Lynn, that Kenny missed that selection. So y'all heard the whole story, which that's okay. But I would encourage you to go read the entire chapter of 11 of John. It is stocked full of emotions. It's stocked full of feelings. Now some might think that I love this scripture lesson because a dead man is brought back to life. And to be sure, the resurrection of sorts is very important to those of us grounded in the Christian faith. Yet the real truth that I love this story is because to me it is so authentic. It's raw. And the real feelings that we hear, if, if we can allow our imaginations to place ourselves in the crowd or in the home, we can almost feel as Mary and Martha and the Jewish authorities and Jesus, we can almost feel what they're feeling. And so I would respectively disagree with Morris Albert that feelings are nothing more than feelings. They're very real, very powerful. And so I'd invite you to go with me just for a few minutes and insert ourselves into this story. Now John has in common with the other gospel writers, Mark and Matthew and Luke, that he sets up his version of Jesus' life and ministry with some stories of who Jesus was and where Jesus came from. But unlike the other three gospel writers, John's gospel doesn't have a birth narrative. John begins by cutting to the chase. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So John quickly and boldly claims that Jesus has been with God all along. It didn't just happen at the manger. And that Jesus was right there in the beginning in Genesis. If you'll read Genesis, you'll remember there's a place where it says, We created them in our image. I'm telling you, we could spend weeks just on that Genesis verse and on this one here, in the beginning was the Word. But I give you that background because for John, Jesus and God one and the same. So it's no wonder we see a lot of miracles in John's Gospel. Extraordinary, superhuman kind of stories. And this story of Jesus raising Lazarus is one of the highlights of John's Jesus slash God. Many times, and most times in my history with the church, preachers focus on just the resurrection of John 11 and claim that it absolutely without a doubt was physical resurrection. But I want to take just a little different turn. I know that will be surprising. I'd like us to focus on the feelings around this story. Because frankly, realizing that I feel these same things that are similar to our ancient holy ancestor, it sort of gives me a feeling of being home. So as the story goes, you heard Jesus has been going about the countryside teaching and healing and irritating the political powers and challenging the religious authorities. I like that a lot. Jesus is living countercultural, hanging out with people he's not supposed to hang out with, choosing this ragtag bunch of guys to be his assistants per se and forming friendships with women. It was for all of these reasons and more that the Pharisees were becoming less tolerant of his actions and contrary to their own Jewish law, which called for them to stand up for justice and to live counterculture, they weren't doing that. They had forgotten who they were and what they were called by God to do and instead they were in cahoots with the Roman authorities, all of them. The religious piety, the social authorities, they were getting nervous and quite frankly ticked off. Because crowds were growing and this belief in this Jesus way of living was taking hold in increasing numbers. And Jesus is rejected by the Jews who threatened to stone him for blasphemy. It's against this backdrop that chapter 11 is read. And the first seven verses Lynn read set it in motion. He was trying to attend a Jewish festival in Jerusalem and he got word that Lazarus was ill. And did you remember, not just one time... But the writer of John was pointing out that Jesus had a close relationship with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were his friends. And that's important that he points that out. So Mary and Martha 
it ends the message in John saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. That's the message they sent to Jesus. The guy you love is really sick. And we don't know who delivered the message to Jesus, but whoever did, we get this reaction from Jesus that I think is quite interesting in a nice way to put it. Now keep in mind in the ancient community, they didn't have text. So Jesus gets this message from close friends that one of them is really ill. I want you to think, friends, about a time you've received a message about a loved one who's really ill. Think about how you responded. Or better yet, think about a time when you've sent a message to someone that you count on and that you need in a really difficult situation. And then I want us to imagine that either us or the person we need is only two miles away. Did you catch that in the scripture? If you were only two miles away or the person you needed was only two miles away, how would you expect them to respond? Obviously, Mary and Martha were really concerned about their brother, so concerned that they reached out to the holiest person they knew of in Jesus. Can't we almost feel their desperation? And Jesus hears this and says, Ah, no big deal. This ain't going to kill him. My translation. <laughs> the common English translation says, This illness isn't fatal, it's for the glory of God. So Jesus stayed in Jerusalem another two full days before deciding to go check on Lazarus. Can you imagine how Mary and Martha were feeling? Now listen, even the ancient community, two miles is two miles. Their messenger returns back to their village. Did you find him? Yeah. What did he say? Is he coming? Well, he said the illness wasn't fatal and something about God's glory is going to be shown. But is he coming? I don't know. Didn't seem to me like he was in any hurry. I kept looking behind me. Nobody followed me. Have we ever called on someone with our own desperate needs? Or at least they seem pretty desperate to us. And the response was indifference. Have we ever called on God with our desperate needs and it seemed that God was too busy or too distant or too unconcerned to listen? Or so it seemed. We skip down a few verses and read that when Jesus finally made his way that two miles to Bethany, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Say, so stay with me here. You've got to wake up. Here we go. He said he stayed two days longer, right? It's how many miles? Does it take two days to go two miles? But when he got there, two mile walk, he gets there four days later, not two days. Lazarus was already in the tomb. We know in Jewish tradition, as soon as a person died, their eyes were closed, their body was washed, and they were wrapped and bound. So why did it take two days for Jesus and the disciples to travel two miles? Now, I don't linger long on these type of questions, although they really have to trouble self-proclaimed literal readers of Scripture. Those faith blockers I discuss in week one. So if you all haven't seen that, it's on YouTube. You should go visit, look at the ones about evangelicals and politicians. See, for me, when I read scripture, friends, I want to spend time on the lesson that I might learn, not legalistic contradictions. So we read that Martha heard Jesus was on his way. She ran to meet him. And we don't know if she ran an ancient acre to meet him or halfway. All we know is that she ran to meet Jesus. In other words, she had sit by that empty tomb and that empty chair at the dinner table all she could take. She had to get out of there. She was feeling anxious and sad and in truth agitated because Jesus was taking his own sweet time. And in Mary and Martha's view, that delay meant that it was too late for Lazarus. So I wonder as we continue to reflect, have we ever been in a place that we just had to get out? 
to run, to drive, to do anything, but spend one more empty, lonely moment with seemingly no hope. And I wonder if we felt like God was pausing too long to hear our cries. So we had to take matters in our own hands. I think that's where Martha was. We know from other stories she was not a passive woman. I like her a lot. You remember the story when Jesus stopped by to visit Mary and Martha and she was so busy trying to make things perfect and Mary was just chilling out at Jesus' feet and Mary complained to Jesus and said, aren't you going to do something? Look at my lazy sister. Y'all remember that story? I think I preached on it several weeks back. And Jesus said, oh, Martha, Martha. And I talked about if you change that one consonant from a T and change it to an S, oh, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> Mary's choosing the better way. Mary's choosing to stay in my presence. So it's no surprise that Martha took off running. And she went back and told her passive sister, Jesus is near. He wants to see you. So now passive Mary gets up, says she went to Jesus. A side note, we hear that Jesus still hadn't entered the village. Again, total of two miles but further study tells us that he hadn't entered the village because he was being closely watched by the Pharisees and the civil authorities who were trying to make a case for killing him. Another Jewish tradition which is still present today is when someone in your family dies, you don't leave the house for a visitation or service. Rather, people come to you and they serve you and they care for you. Jews have beautiful rituals and in my opinion, they have far healthier ways of handling death and grief than Christians do. So there were a lot of Jews comforting Mary and Martha in their house, and seemingly they didn't leave when Martha ran to find Jesus. But when Mary got up, passive Mary's getting up. Something's about to happen. So we see that familiar scene where Mary falls to her knees, weeping, and says, If you'd been here, if you'd just been here, my brother would not have died. Whew. the emotions in just that sentence. Deep grief at the loss of her brother. Deep disappointment in Jesus' delay. Have we ever been here before? God, if, if you just listened, if you just answered my prayer, this... Whatever this might be in our lives, God, if you'd been with me, this would not have happened. Jesus asked Mary to take him to where Lazarus is laid and says, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. And along the way, as he was weeping, he had some ridicule going on. Remember in the story, some were saying, Hey, you healed the blind. Why, why'd you let this happen? Where are your miracles now? So Jesus told Martha to remove the stone, and I think this part's sort of funny. She tells Jesus, hey, it's been four days, like A, he couldn't count. <laughs> and then she says, uh, it's going to smell. So she's trusting this guy to do a miracle, but thinks he's not going to be able to figure out there's going to be a smell. As our passage ends, Jesus commands Lazarus to come out. And our story said he did so. Interesting, too. He came out, but his hands and feet were bound. That must have been interesting, huh? You all see how I love to mess with people who claim to take the Bible literally. So Jesus told them, untie him and let him go. We say, and we believe here at Bluegrass, that there is room enough for all of us and any others who yearn for a loving, authentic church family. And we gather every week, week in and week out, and I know full well that our diversity stretches widely in any number of ways, including how we interpret Scripture. For some in this room, the belief here in John 11 is that Lazarus was raised literally, physically. And for some of us, it is metaphoric. For others, it's symbolic. But no matter where you land, it's okay. 
that's why it's our faith journey. For me, as with many other scripture lessons, I don't get too hung up on the details of legalistic interpretation. And it's taken me a long while, but I've gotten pretty good at avoiding arguing with folks who are sure set in their beliefs. I'm likely not going to change their minds one bit with something I say. I may have a shot with something I do or how I live. But here's what I know, friends, in the depths of my soul about feelings that can block our faith. I've been at the point of desperation. I've weeped at the news of loved ones, illnesses, and deaths. I've had serious financial setbacks and relationship breakdowns and career challenges. And especially in these last eight and a half years as pastor, I've sat by many bedsides or in living rooms or in coffee shops or on the other end of a phone that contains a text message or a Facebook message. And I've heard desperate cries for help. Yearning needs for peace and comfort. In my last year of seminary, I had to do chaplaincy. And I say I had to do it because I went kicking and screaming, oh, another hoop I have to go through to be ordained. So my assignment was at Veterans Hospital, Leestown Road and over there behind UK Hospital. But I also volunteered to do children's chaplaincy at the UK Children's Hospital when they needed a little extra help. So I was doing chaplaincy, and let me tell you, friends, we can talk all this theology and all this stuff we want to, but where the rubber hits the road, it's when you talk to people who've been in war. Or you talk to parents whose children are terminally ill. I got to know two families very, very well, both with four-year-old kids, a little girl and a little boy. They both had cancer. The little girl's family was really religious. In fact, they brought in, they really were very conservatively religious and prayer chains and posters all over the room from their churches that were praying for them and, and saying to them, God can do a miracle. God's going to heal her. That's a whole other subject we'll talk about another day. The little boy's family wasn't religious at all. But they were very caring, very loving. Well, I'll just fast forward to tell you, as you might expect, the little girl died. The little boy lived. And as I sat with those parents, separately, of course, of course, the little boy's parents were happy and celebrating. They weren't thanking God because they weren't believers. They were just grateful spirits. And yet, we formed a relationship and a friendship because I don't judge folks based on their faith journey, what they believe, how they believe, or if they don't believe. So I just sat with them as a friend and I told them that I was so grateful and happy for them. And then I said, now you all know that I do believe in God. We do, chaplain. And I think that the God that I serve is celebrating too with you and is sharing your joy. I was with the little old girl's family with posters still on the wall. And they said to me, Chaplain, why did God let this happen? I said, friends, I don't share the theology of your home church, but I don't think that God picks and chooses who God cures of cancer or which house God keeps from being demolished in a tornado I don't think that's how God works and if it was I'd want no part of God but here's what I believe I believe that God is weeping with you just like God weeped on the way to the tomb of Lazarus and I believe that God's going to grant you peace and comfort that will take time and I don't know how it all works out, 
But in some way, somehow, I believe with all my heart that your little girl is pain-free and being embraced and cared for in a place of eternal peace. And whatever that needs to be, God's going to figure that out. I don't have to try to design it. I kept in touch with that family, and it took them a while to resolve their faith. They actually ended up leaving that church because it gave them and fed them a theology that, frankly, didn't work. But they're still very faithful people. Feelings can block our faith. And I know two things about feelings. Tough times are going to come for every single one of us. And yet, God's going to always be present with us. Some of y'all were here when January, when we did some creative things. Oh, we went to Mad Potter and we painted mugs and we went to painting with a twist. We painted canvas. And some of you gathered here and had a writing group that still continues. So as part of that, I tried to be intentional about going to my piano at least three times a week. So it was on January the 26th that I was doing something I'd never done before, which was FaceTime Live. And I had this tune that came to me. And then I just had this thought, and I was live on Facebook. Never done it before, never done it since. And I said, uh, so where do you all, Facebook folks, whoever's out there, where do you find God's presence? Well, Kathy Lyon was here. Uh, she's a member here. She's not here this morning. But she said, just put some comments there. And then uh, Sharon Rodriguez, who used to come to church here, we still stay connected. And she said some things about God's presence. So I took what Kathy said and wrote a verse 1. And I took what Sharon said and I wrote a verse 2. And I would love for Brenda to be playing it, but I don't read music. And I haven't been able to send it to somebody who does. And I have this really low voice, Daniel. And those of you who were here last Sunday know that when I play piano, everything's in the key of C. Maybe a black, maybe a black uh, note here and there. But this little keyboard that Brenda got me, well, I got it, and then I told her she got it for me. <laughs> but it's got this little trick on it that you can take key of C and make it a key of G or A, or whatever you want it to be. <coughs> so that's why I'm playing instead of Brenda. Whew, deep breaths. Kathy's words. When the sunshine fills the sky, you are there. In the wonder of children's eyes, you are there. When the birds sing their song, when a child laughs alone in creation and in each other, you are there. You are there. You are there. In my dad. My confusion, you are there, granting peace, grace and love, as my life's journey carries on, 
you are there. Some of Sharon's comments. When my heart is filled with sadness, you are there. And my losses seem much more than I can bear. When I seek answers, when I pray, in the midst of troubled days, in your presence I find hope, you are there. my doubts and my confusion, you are there, granting peace, grace and love, as my life's journey carries on. You are there. I invite you just to be in silence, closing your eyes or not. Thank you. Thank you. Oh God, for always be. Just like with scripture, we have different ideas about what this table represents. For some, it is the body and blood of Christ. For others, it is a symbol and remembrance. For still others, they're really not sure. But you know, Jesus gathered with people in a room, and we read that story, and there are a lot of people unsure. <laughs> Betrayers and doubters, and there were believers. But every person in the room, Jesus said, I want you to share this meal with me and with one another. And every time you do that, I want you to remember my life. How I taught you to love. How I taught you to live. This table is not yours. And it is certainly not mine. This is God's table. Let's sing that faith.
God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of joy. Let us pray. So God, here we are. We've heard the call to come to your table of love and joy and hope and peace. And we've heard that we are all welcome. And so as we gather, we remember this prophet, rabbi, this amazing son that you sent to us to show us a new way to live in love, to show us how to do it, to give an example to the courage and perseverance and discipline that it took. And so as we gather, we remember all of that. And we ask that somehow you take this crumb of bread and this sip of juice to remind us that we too are called to be changers in your and our world. And we pray that you take this crumb and this sip to give us courage and perseverance and discipline to continue our faith journey even when feelings can block them. We remember how Jesus taught us to pray, our Creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Jesus gathered with his friends that night and there are also some other folks hunkered in because anyone who was seen in the crowds following him, they were going to be hunted down as well. Lots of folks in that room, many, many scholars think women and children were in there. So Jesus took a loaf of bread. It would be the last night he would be with them physically. So he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he said, take and eat. I've lived my life for you. And now because I won't stop doing, loving, living, I'm going to lose my life for you. After supper, can you imagine those feelings in the room? Grief, confusion, doubt, anger. Golly, we left everything to follow you, and now for what? Jesus knew about those feelings. It was the Jewish custom to take a cup after supper, and on this night he took a cup and he blessed it in the same way. He said, this cup's a new sign. It's my promise to you. I'm not going to leave you. I may not be here physically, but I'm not going to leave you. My spirit will always be with you. Friends, this morning, no matter who you are or where you are, even on your faith journey, a lot of churches give out rules for communion. And I've read all the gospel accounts of this supper. And you know what they have in common? No rules. Jesus said to all those in the room, and some of them probably just got into the last second. They didn't know what it's all about. They certainly didn't believe what it's all about. He said, take and eat. Be in communion with one another. Find your center. Be in communion with God. That is my prayer for you, friends. So you're invited to take a piece of bread as it passes, and then after a time of meditation to drink from the cup.
with a gluten sensitivity, we have gluten free as well. Just raise your hand, and I'll get it to you. As we take our morning offering, I want to share something with you all that was sent to me yesterday. I think maybe Deb Kors saw it. Some of you are familiar with the group that travels through Lexington to do mission work. It's a group of youth, and we have housed them here, and they've slept in our fellowship hall, and we've fed them breakfast, and they've attended worship with us. Tim Sandifer is the leader, and at times, Tim and his wife and two kids, his little boy is so cute, always wants to wear a hat, uh, like a dress hat it's so cute but anyway they come here sometimes but he said this to me yesterday I wanted to share with you a recent post from one of my high school youth a conversation I had about a month ago in my sociology class that had me restless last night this from the kid a bit ago we had a topic proposed to us about the main institutions of socialization religion being one of them and the effect it has on the emergence of transgender youth. Of course, this topic slowly steered in the direction of the rest of the LGBTQA community and the effect of religion on that community. Conversation was heating up in a class over this, and I was saddened to realize how little people fully understood the Christian umbrella of religion. The girl next to me was shocked even to learn that there is a denomination of Christianity, the United Church of Christ, that fully embraces people of this community. I want this falling statement to stay firm for all the people that read it. And that people do not feel turned away from a church for simply identifying as one in this group. I am truly on behalf of my religion for that. I hope one day you can find a church that never makes you feel that way again. For the preceding 10 minutes, I had the pleasure of educating her a little bit more about this denomination she didn't know existed and the God still speaking mentality. I'm grateful to say that my church has provided me with the opportunity to travel the country serving the Lord, along with attending many churches, all with the same ideology. I told her about this small church called Bluegrass United Church of Christ in Kentucky that I get to visit almost every summer, and how no matter what, they always have an open-door policy for everyone they meet. I felt the need to say this because regardless of anyone's specific views on the LGBTQA community and religion, I've grown up in a world where many people around me identify as this group. I've had many conversations with my peers to educate them. And as a Christian myself, I feel it's my duty to remind this growing generation of non-believers that the fundamental principle behind all of Christianity is love and compassion. Thank you, church, for welcoming people into our little church. We never know who it's going to touch. Let us pray. God, sometimes we get overwhelmed by the needs. And in truth, at least the pastor of this church sometimes feels like, what? We're we really making a difference in, the, in a real way. We're tucked over here in a small neighborhood small group of folks, most of him, whom which frankly wouldn't be accepted in the largest churches with the loudest pulpits and the biggest budgets. But here we are. 
Here we are making a difference in our own lives, in the lives of people that pass our way. And so God, we just pray that however we give our gifts in our time and energy and cleaning or mowing or making sure the building is safe and secure week after week, in organizing and preparing nosh and serving communion and giving our financial resources, however we give, it is our prayer that we will continue to touch and transform lives, maybe even our own. Amen. Thank you. Closing him this morning is sing praise to God who has shaped. And as we sing, sometimes folk that want to join our church, we just say it's a time in your life where you're saying at this point in your life, this feels like home and this is where you'd like to walk your faith journey. So if that's something you're interested in, do it. I'll be happy to welcome you at the front. Let's sing together.
just saying, my brothers and sisters, God is your light. So ever keep this in sight as we leave this place. May we be that light and live that light and give that light. Amen. 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 Circle, draw the circle wide.